Happy Thanksgiving, America. I'm Canadian. I already had my Thanksgiving and I'm still full. Uh, but it's this your. A month ago. <laughs> I, I ate a lot. So I want to go over some of your favorite Thanksgiving cakes that I have made on the channel. And this happens to include my all time favorite cake that I have made on the channel, which is a roasted Thanksgiving turkey. In fact, let's start there. What can I say? I love everything about this cake. I often say that it's my favorite because it's one of the few cakes on the channel that I wouldn't change a thing about, and that says a lot. I have a cake gallery on my phone, and when I tell you that hardly any of the cakes have made it into that gallery, this is one of my favorites. We should unlock that gallery one day. Sure. The inside of the turkey was quite simple because I wanted to make sure that when the turkey was complete and you carve it, um, it looked like as much like, you know, the meat of a turkey as possible, which is very bland looking and light in color. So I chose uh, to make my ultimate vanilla cake and fill it with Italian meringue buttercream. All my cake rounds, once they were leveled, I cut them in half to make two semicircles, and then I built the cake like that and flipped it and then carved. Because I was thinking of the body of a turkey and how it sort of goes like this. The hardest part about the cake was carving. One of the great things about this cake is every single turkey looks different. So it's not supposed to be symmetrical, but I often have trouble with this. This is what I overthink when I can't measure. So I remember thinking while I was carving this, what did I get myself into? It's never gonna look like a turkey. And then I moved on to carve the, I'm gonna just call them the legs and the arms. Oh, we've been through this. We've been yeah. through this before. The legs and the arms from other pieces of cake. And then the whole time sort of putting it together to see if it looks good together and that the legs and the arms are to scale with the body. The thing about this cake is it would have been easy to have a model, not really, because we would have had to roast it. I just didn't want to have a raw turkey in the kitchen with cake. Ew. Once I'm happy with the shape of the body, the legs and the arms, it is time to crumb coat the whole cake. I am gonna keep the legs and arms separate for now, crumb coat them, chill. And then once the crumb coat is chilled, I'm gonna ice all five parts. Now I can move on to fondant. Uh, this is where it got creepy because I needed to color the fondant a base color that would support the tones in the turkey. And it was quite an ugly color. <laughs> it was really, it was a really odd ET looking color. <laughs> the first thing I did was cover the body with that fondant, smoothed it all over, and then I covered the legs and the arms. This is where I tried to figure out how to texture it. And what I ended up doing is using some shelf liner. It's like a silicone mat, but it has a texture. And I just had a new roll and I pressed it into the fondant. Most cakes, you never wanna dent the fondant or make it look uneven, but this only helps it to look more realistic. A turkey would never be perfectly smooth and matte. And if you do get served a smooth and matte turkey, don't eat it. <laughs> it's not, uh, it's not organic. Um, <laughs> Like, is it Botox turkey? Yeah, who knows? Are, are turkeys doing Botox now? They should do something about their necks, though. <laughs> <laughs> if I were them, I would start there. And then I have to make the wing part. It's too small to make it out of cake, and then it would have just looked unrealistic, so I made it solely out of my weird colored fondant, textured it, and added it to the cake. And again, you want to make sure to do it slightly imperfect. You don't want them to be perfectly symmetrical on the turkey, because that wouldn't happen, especially when you roast it, right? Do you think turkeys were dinosaurs? I'm sorry, what? Why do they have such small, useless wings? They must have evolved from something. So then, if your theory is right, why aren't chickens and turkeys born without wings? They're not using it. Is it because they know they're delicious? Probably. <laughs> If, if they're, listen, if turkey and chicken loses their wings, there'll be no hot ones. This is a big problem, yeah, this <laughs> right? Is problem. I decided to make the bones out of modeling chocolate because fondant is too white to look like a bone. Modeling chocolate is already an ivory off-white. It has a nice uh, texture to it and it's completely, it's, I mean, it's called modeling chocolate. It's perfect for modeling shapes. <laughs> what kind of chocolate are you? I'm modeling chocolate. <laughs> 
Actually, I don't hang out with chocolate bars because I model. And um, Yolanda has used me to make bones, so. <laughs> has she used you? Oh no, I didn't think so. All right, so I feel like this is a video where you all learned how much I love ivory. There was a lot of ivory. Yeah. So the most important thing is to layer on the paint because when you roast a turkey, again, it doesn't have a perfectly even color. Some parts are more well roasted and building in layers also helps you because if you're not happy with the first layer, you just keep adding and adding until you are happy like a painter. As I was painting, I decided to use cocoa. Loved this effect. I love it because cocoa is edible. It's the perfect tone of brown because it's a natural brown, whereas food coloring brown can be really difficult. It always has a pinkish undertone. Now, when you roast a turkey, it's very important to tie it up. You could use real string, but of course I made it. I just made myself a little rope. And then of course, the most fun part is the stuffing, which you can make just like stuffing without cooking it. So just think about replacing all the bread bits with cubes of cake and put in anything you like that goes with cake. I did dried figs, dried apricots, and I used apricot jam to, to keep it all together and then put it in place as if it's bursting out of your roasted turkey. This cake is good. I love it. Look, I never talk about cake like this. <laughs> I always talk about it like it's slightly defeating me. And it is. So let's move on to the next cake, which is a sweet potato casserole. I've never actually had a sweet potato casserole, but I hear that it is a very traditional American dessert, especially for Thanksgiving. And so I decided to cakeify it. Casserole dish and all. The best part of this cake is it is infused with the flavors that are in this dessert. So I made it out of sweet potato cake, which is exactly like my carrot cake, but I replace the grated carrot with grated sweet potato when I make the batter. I'm gonna carve the cake because casserole dishes are beveled. What you wanna do is take your leveled cake um, and then whatever's gonna be the bottom, you're gonna cut a little A line on all four sides, as well as round out the corners the way that a casserole dish would be. And then I left the cake upside down for the whole decorating process until I flipped it over to top it. The other thing I love about this cake is I made brown sugar buttercream. I think this is the first time. It's so good. And with the sweet potato cake and it has that molassesy sweetness. Perfect pairing. And it's like a hug. It's like a hug. I should have written that in layer up. <laughs> Brown sugar buttercream, like a hug. Yeah. Once you're happy with the shape of the cake, you can crumb coat it, ice it, the usual, and then it was time for me to cover it in my very fall-inspired color, a reddish pumpkin-y tone. And I think it looks great. I actually think it's one of the reasons that this cake looks so great. When I trim away the excess, I get annoyed by the line that's left. But in this case, I liked it because it looks like the edge of a dish. And then I used a veining tool to make indents and two lines around uh, the perimeter. Oh, I remember this. Because you know how casserole dishes often have that? Like they're not very detailed, but that would be the detail on it. At this point, I flipped it over. I brushed a little clear piping gel on that edge of fondant, and then I rolled a cream colored fondant out really thin, bigger than my cake, and laid it on top, smoothed it along the edge, then I flipped it back. And the reason I did this is that inner color of the casserole dish often extends to the top of the yeah. handles. And I had to do it in a seamless way. The next thing I did is create handles. And for this, I used foam core. The handles don't jut out a lot. They tend to be very shallow. But even if I just made them out of gum paste, I would have had to make them so far in advance to let them dry. And sometimes the problem with that is the color of your fondant can change in the drying process and then not look like the Not dish. Much. I added the handles on either side. Then what I did is I trimmed the cream fondant all the way around the dish, including the handles. And you need to do this carefully and now flip the cake back over. So now the whole top is covered cream, but we need to just make this look as if it's an edge. I'll just use like mat board that you use for uh, uh, framing pictures. And I cut like a quarter inch. And then I use that as a guide to cut all along the casserole dish. So it's like framing, as if it's the top edge. 
So I made my spice nuts. They are delicious. They're in my book layer up. And of course I wanna make sure I have toasted marshmallows on top of this sweet potato casserole. And I'm just going to top the casserole. I loved it. I have this cake in my phone. Ha! And I can't tell you how many people, when I show it to them, they think it's a casserole dish. Yeah. Like it doesn't really fit when I scroll through that album. Like, why is that one in a dish? I'm like, no, that's cake. We're gonna move on to the final cake, and I feel like I'm gonna cause a Thanksgiving dessert battle, because the final cake is a giant slice of pumpkin pie. So feel free to let us know what you do in your household. Is it sweet potato casserole or is it pumpkin pie? For the pumpkin pie, Orhan, I baked your favorite cake, which is my pumpkin spice cake. And I used a template to cut out a triangle that looks like a slice. Use that template on all four of your cakes, and then you're gonna have four sections to build up the slice. I approached this cake really differently. I knew that fondant would wouldn't really look like pumpkin pie, the inside of a pumpkin pie. So what I did is I created a cake paste. In fact, I just realized I did that when I rewatched the video right now. We just paused and I rewatched it because I thought, what am I doing? So all that leftover cake you have that's cut away, we're gonna make use of that. You can put it in a food processor, blend it into crumbs, and then put it in a mixing bowl and add piping gel and buttercream to it. Blended it together till it was like the thickness of ganache because what I did is piped a fence with that. Lay the first one down, pipe a fence of this pumpkin spice cake paste, fill in between the fence with Italian meringue buttercream, and then repeat until you stack the whole cake. I made more paste um, in just a different tone. So more cake, more buttercream, no piping gel this time. And I added some orange buttercream to it as well to get that pumpkin pie color. And then I crumb coated my whole cake in that mixture. So the next thing I had to do when the crumb coat was chilled is ice the whole cake in the cake paste. When I iced the sides, I wanted to like make it look like it was a cut slice of pie. So I purposely iced downward and like pulled away. Once we do that, we're good. We're gonna chill the cake. And then the next thing you need to do is create some fondant that looks like pastry. So for this, guess what? Ivory, these are back in the ivory days. Hardcore ivory, yeah, <laughs> ivory core. Um, <laughs> you might have heard of it, I invented it. <laughs> the next thing you need to do is trim the fondant. So you wanna take a sharp paring knife and trim it along the side, down the side, across the bottom edge, across the other bottom edge, and down the other side as well. And then the top, I inserted toothpicks an equal distance from each other into the fondant and into the cake. And that way it was like supporting the fondant and I could just leave it in place. The next thing I'm gonna do is put fork indents, and I have a giant fork, so I use that to make imprints into the fondant, and the next thing I have to do is paint that fondant. And I also use Mr. Burns, once again, to brulee the top of the pie. Because you pour pumpkin pie filling into a pie, sometimes it's uneven and when you bake it, you get like little bubbles or one part is a little overdone. So that's what I used Mr. Burns for. And I just added several dollops as if you just cut yourself a slice and you're just getting a dollop of whipped cream from the bowl and you're putting it on top and you're about to eat. And you're already really full from the turkey and everything else, but there's no way you're giving up pumpkin pie. So there you have it, guys. I hope you enjoy your Thanksgiving turkeys. And again, I wanna know which dessert wins, sweet potato casserole or pumpkin pie. And also, is there a Thanksgiving cake that I haven't caked that you wanna see me cake? Leave it in the comments below and I just want you to know that I'm thankful you're all here. I'll see you next week.